Hey everyone, I hope you're all doing well. Um, this is another deep dive exercise. This week we're looking at list ops, but we're doing this one slightly differently. So normally we go through 10, 12, 15 different solutions that people have come up with and sort of dig into them, look at how people have approached it differently. But really this week, there are only two types of solutions to this exercise. One is to take an imperative approach and one is to take a more functional approach using things like recursion. So we thought it would make more sense to do a bit of a deep dive into imperative code versus recursive code to look at how to solve this exercise, both in an imperative and a recursive way, and to compare the implementations as we go. And then later on, we are going to look at a couple of the recursive solutions, um, the functional solutions. We're going to look at tail call recursion and dig into that a little bit. And Eric's going to be joining me for that and talking us through that. But I'm going to start us off just by solving the exercise uh, in an imperative manner and in a functional manner. I'm going to be doing this in JavaScript. Um, that's not the most brilliant language to, to solve this in from a functional perspective, but I think it's really interesting to use the same language for both approaches. And I thought that JavaScript is probably a language that most people have some familiarity with, uh, or at least can pass relatively easily. So we'll start off taking uh, each of the different functions that we have to define one by one. We will uh, look at them, create them in an imperative version, and then we'll create uh, a recursive version next to them. So in case you don't know the exercise, I should probably say, uh, the aim of the exercise is to look at a list. Uh, a list is literally a list of, of things. Um, some languages might have call them arrays, uh, which can be slightly different or they can be the same. Um, or other languages might call them vectors, but a list of, of different um, values and to implement various functions or methods that operate on those values. So we're going to look at things like count, so how many items are in the list. We're going to look at appending items. We're going to look at filtering, at mapping, at folding left, at folding right. So that's going to be uh, the deep dive that we're going to. I hope it's interesting. If you're already really familiar with recursion, if you know recursion, if that's sort of quite easy, you might want to jump forward into the video uh, to when we start talking about tail call recursion, when we start comparing uh, I think ML with F sharp. Um, we look at Elixir as well. There's various different uh, functional approaches that we look at in more depth. But if recursion isn't something that you're super familiar with, if you'd like a bit of a practical, hands-on uh, refresher, then this might be the best place to start. So let's dig in. Um, I'm going to be working, as I said, in, uh, in VS Code. Um, I've got uh, up here just a, a space to type some code, hello. And down here, uh, I've got a little console where I'm just going to run the code. I'm going to do that just by calling node on this file that's code.js. And at the moment, you can see that does absolutely nothing. So the first thing we're going to do is define uh, the length function. Um, and we're looking at a list. Let's say we've got a list like uh, one, two, three. And we want uh, a function that calculates the length of that list. So how many items does it have? And we're going to end up calling this um, with console log, which is how in JavaScript you just output stuff. And we're going to call length and we're going to call it with the parameter of list. So we need to define uh, the function length that takes a list. And just to check everything's working, let's just return hello world here. So we should be able to come down and yeah, we see we're calling the function and we're returning this, fine. So what's our imperative uh, methodology going to be for this? Well, we're going to create a, um, a variable, a counter, uh, that we set to zero, and we're just going to loop through. So we're going to say for each item of the list, uh, we are going to just increment the count by one, and then at the end, we'll return the count. So we've got three items in the list. We loop through each item in the list, and we get a count out the other end. And if we run this, we should now, and we do, successfully see that we have uh, a length of three. We'll dig into the functional version of this in a moment. Before we do that, I'm just going to do one other um, variant, uh, one of the other uh, functions that we have to define, and that one is reverse. Um, I think it'll just make it a bit easier to see a couple of these first and get the patterns in our mind. I might even do map in the uh, imperative way first, and then we're going to see how these patterns apply. So we've done length. Uh, now we're going to look at the reverse function. Reverse, uh, again, it takes a list, and the idea is that you output 
uh, the opposite of the list. So we take in one, two, three, and we want to return three, two, one. So very similar, we're going to make a reversed um, value here uh, that starts off as an empty array. And we're going to say uh, for I, uh, well, we're going to work backwards. So we're going to start at coming from the right hand side of the list, three, two, one, and we're going to then work through building it up. So let's create a variable I, and we'll use the length function we've just made to get the length of this list. So we're going to start at uh, the length minus one, because arrays index from zero. We're going to say, well, I is greater than or equal to zero, then we decrement. And we're going to add to this uh, the item of that index, and then we're going to return it. So we should now see if we change this length to reverse, that when we run things, oops, run it down here, we have three, two, one, uh, that is because I've done that. <laughs> there we go, if we try a minute now, there we go, we get three, two, one coming out. This is live coding, I'm making this up, I will make mistakes. Um, so we've now looped through this list, added each of these items in reverse order, to this uh, value, this variable are reversed and returned it, nice and simple. And the final one we're going to look at is the map um, function. A map takes another function and it applies it to each element. So in this case, we're going to create, and I'll do this first, uh, another function, which is called subtract one. Um, and this takes a number and this literally returns the number minus one. Uh, and if we if we call this now, just to be super clear, if we call uh, console log uh, subtract one with the number five, I'll just comment these two out for a second, uh, and then we run this, we should get back four. So simplest function you can imagine really. But what we want to do is take this list and we want to apply this function to every item in the list. So we want the list to output 0, 1, 2. So we're subtracting one from each thing. And so to do that, we create a map function that's going to take the list and it's going to apply this function or call this function with each of the different items in that list. So this is again going to follow the same pattern. So we're going to start off creating this mapped um, array. We're then going to loop through, and we're going to say for each item in the list, it's exactly the same as we did in the count earlier. And then we're going to say mapped, and we're going to push onto it the, uh, the result of this function being called on the item. And then we're going to return that. And then we've now got two functions, map and subtract. If we call this with map, list, and subtract one, and then call this, we'll get out 0, 1, and 2. If we create, if we change this function, in fact, to be uh, a doubler function, and we can now say times it by 2, we can change this, and we're now going to get 2, 4, and 6. Okay, so we're now going to look at the recursive functional solutions to this instead. Um, I'm going to comment out all the stuff that we've done uh, so far. And we're going to firstly start off by looking at this map method. Now, although this is the most complex of the methods, um, I think probably out of those three, you'd agree it is. I actually think it's also the easiest um, to actually demonstrate uh, the functional approach to. But I want to start off by getting you to think about the shape of the imperative code we've just looked at. The shape of the code we've just looked at has been to create this intermediate variable we're doing something with. In this case, it's an array. In this case, it's an array. In this case, it's a, a counter and a, a number. Then to loop through each of the elements in our list. We have loops in all of these. Then we do something with that intermediate variable. So we add the item, we add the item, or we increment the count. And then we finally return that intermediate variable. Those are the sort of imperative patterns. They'll feel really normal to you. They'll feel like sort of your bread and butter. But actually, what I want to do is now show you the functional patterns, the recursive patterns. Uh, and those will feel very different, but they're actually not any more complicated. They just feel different. And once you get to recognize and remember the patterns, everything else becomes quite easy. And 
In JavaScript, because it's not, uh, well, it is a functional language, but it's not a functional language in the sense of being really designed to do recursion, these other things. Some of the syntax is a bit verbose and a bit long-winded. You'll see in the second half of the video that actually the syntax is really concise, really small, really easy to do a lot of what I'm showing you here. But let's start off with the first of these concepts you need to understand, which is the concept of the head and the tail. Um, the head and the tail are critical parts of understanding how you recurse. But they're very, very simple. The head is the first element of a list, and the tail is the rest of the list. In JavaScript, we can get that by doing this. So if you've got the list one, two, three, the head of the list is the number one, and the tail of the list is two and three. If we made this bigger, this would be the head, and this would be the tail. And this is a really important concept, as you'll see. So what I want to do is just log this out, um, and we'll just log a few things out. So we'll log out the list, we'll log out the head, and we'll log out the tail. And if I've done that correctly, uh, we should now be able to, I think, just run this. Um, yeah, and we'll get the list as one, two, three which it is, what we call it in with, one, two, three. The head is the number one, and the tail is the number two and three. That's a key core concept. Just take a minute, make sure you understand. When you've got a list, the head is the first element. It's, in this case, a number. And the tail is the rest of the list. Now, in this imperative programming, you call this function map once, and then you loop through the list and do something with it. In recursive programming, rather than just calling the function once, you call the function lots of times, but with a slightly different list. And the list you keep calling it with is the tail. So the first time it's called, it's gonna be called with this line here. The second time it's called, it's gonna be called with two as the head, and three as the tail. In fact, I'm just going to make this one, one longer just to show things a bit more. Um, and we can run this code, but it will blow up. Um, and it will blow up because, as you can see here, when the list is empty, we're still going to keep on calling this function over and over and over again forever. So we need a guard clause here. Um, and the easiest guard clause is if the list's length is zero, um, then we are going to return. So when we get an empty list passed into here, then we're just going to get out of there. Otherwise, we'll call the function again. Let's just look at this data. If we run this now, so you'll see that the first time this gets called, it gets called with the list of one, two, three, four. The second time it's called with two, three, four. The third time it's called with three, four. And the final time it's called with four. But the key thing really to understand is this head number. The first time it's called with the head of one, the second time with the head of two, the third time with the head of three, and the fourth time with the head of four. And this really is just another way of looping like this. We're getting the first item out of this list. So at the moment, this doesn't really do anything useful. But if we go back to what we had here, we called function on the item. An item is just the head. We could just rename this to item. Um, so let's come back and do this. So we call function now on the, on the head. And then we want to pass the rest of the list as well. And there are lots of different ways to do this. And again, this is where when we look at functional languages later on, the syntax becomes a, a bit nicer. And then the easiest way to show this is, is this. So we're creating a new list with just one element, which is the head with the function applied to it. So it's exactly the same as what we have here. And then we are adding this new list we've created to the remainder of the list. And if we run this, we will find that if we return this, we now get two, four, six, eight. If you remember, we're calling this with a doubler function. So we're taking one, two, three, four, 
and we're getting out two, four, six, eight. So hopefully you can see and understand what's happening here. So I want to move on to the next function and we're going to keep looking at these. And I think as we keep looking at them and we start seeing the patterns over and over again, things will become simpler. And so this time I want to look at the length function. So I'm going to move it down here. Um, and we basically want to delete this code and we're going to do a very similar thing to what we did before. So we're going to take all of this and we're going to put this in like this. And this time, rather than applying a function to the head, we're going to have this exact same line, but we're just going to return the number one. And then we're going to return the length. This is uh, doing exactly the same thing, looping through, getting the head and tail, recursing, calling the next function. But rather than building up a new list like this does, it's building up a number, which is one plus the length of whatever is remaining. And so if we run this code, let's just change this to be the length of this. We can just comment this out as well, we don't need it. Keep things a bit tidier. Um, we'll now see, hopefully, uh, we won't. Because my code's wrong. We'll now see, hopefully, we'll now see, hopefully, that we get the number four out. So what were my two mistakes there, just to be clear? One, I'd left in this extra parameter that we have to pass into uh, map. And the second one was that I was returning an empty array here, whereas actually we should return zero. So let's think about what's happening here. So we're ending up effectively with something at the end of this that looks like this. So we are calling one plus the length of uh, two, three, and four. And then we are calling one plus one plus the length of two of three four and then we are calling one plus one plus the length of four and then we are calling and at the end of that we get four and it's really that simple as to what's happening here and so if we do this same little bit of logic here and break, break this down in the same way, here we're calling, uh, this is the doubler function. So we're calling two, I'm just gonna, yeah, that's right. We're, gonna call, we're calling two plus four plus two plus four plus, uh, is it eight, six? Two plus four plus six plus eight. I'm just giving you a second to just Take that in, have a look at that, and see how these two patterns are identical. So maybe this one makes a bit more, a bit more sense at a first glance. But then maybe that one helps you understand this one a little bit more. And something to note here is that we're not actually using the head at all. We could just delete that line if we weren't, well, I think it'll just come as undefined. We're not actually using head at all here, so we could just get rid of it. And you'll note it's the same in here. We don't actually use item. We could just, if, we, if the language allowed, we could just have a placeholder that doesn't actually get set in that point. Um, but I'll leave it in for now, just for sanity's sake. Um, so finally, let's have a look at this reversed option. We'll do this down here. Oops. 
I keep pressing my Vim shortcut to uncomment things and then remembering that doesn't work here. So let's do reverse of uh, list one, two, three, four. So this was our function for that. We're going to get rid of this. We don't need it. And we're going to, we'll take this, uh, this one as our starting point. Um, so we're going to exactly the same, get a head, get a tail, print it out. If the length of the list is zero, we are going to return uh, an empty array. And in this, we've got um, the new array that we're building with applying that, uh, that function to head. But to reverse the array, all we need to do is this. And if we look now, we've reversed 4, 3, 2, 1. So the only little bit of code that needs to change is this little bit of code here. And just to be clear on what's happening there, we are firstly working our way all the way down until we get the final element in the array, the final head. And then onto that, we're adding the remainder of everything else. So if we work this through, we'll do it again how we did it here. So we're going to start off by saying, We've got the reverse of two, three, four, and then we're going to have one. Let's just get rid of some of these. And now we've got the reverse of this plus uh, like that. And then we've got the reverse of four like this. And now we've got the reverse of this plus four, plus three, two, one. And at the end of that, of course, that is oops, this, which is this. So hopefully what you're seeing now is that in all of these cases, the only thing that we're changing is this one little bit of code. And so actually what you're ending up with maybe realizing is that the whole of the function really is just this one little line of code here. And everything else is sort of boilerplate. And what you're going to see as we move forward is actually uh, how this boilerplate tends to get built into functional programming languages for you. Okay, so we're going to look at one more function, which is the fold left function. And what this does is it takes a list and you can think of it literally folding each element of the list into one uh, end value or result. Um, a nice example of this is if you've got a list of numbers and you want to add those numbers together. So you want to uh, move through each, each element and fold each one on top of the other, building up a nice stack until you've got one final number. Another example might be you've got, say, again, the same list of numbers and you want to concatenate those into one string. So each time you're going through and you're adding to a string. And we'll look at um, both of those examples just to try it. So let's have a, we call this um, function fold L normally. And it takes in a list um, and it takes in a starting value and it also takes in a function that we're going to apply. Uh, and we'll take, let's copy something we've already got. So let's copy this map um, function. I really like seeing the symmetry in these patterns because I think it really helps to understand things. Um, and so rather than having mapped, we're going to have total. And total is set at the beginning to start, um, or if, let's call it final. Um, and we are going to iterate through each item in the list again. And we're going to say that final is set to the function. And the function should take the, um, can I remember which way around it is? It starts off with the final item. Hold on, I'm just going to check this is right. Yeah. Just looking at one of Eric's solutions to remind myself. Yeah, it starts off with the, the final value that it takes in and the item that it wants to append to it. So. If we have a function here, let's make a new function and we call this summer. So it's a lovely name for a function. Um, 
And this is going to take in a total and a number. In fact, it's going to take in number one and number two, I guess. But uh, let's call this number one and number two. And it's going to return num1 plus num2. And then I'm going to call this with uh, fold left the list, our starting value that we have to pass in, which is zero, and then our function, which is summer. And then if I run this code here, I get the number 10 out. So this has gone through and it's added each of these numbers together. One plus two plus three plus four does indeed equal 10. And this also works for uh, other things like concatenating. So if we call it, make a new thing called uh, concata, and we have, uh, let's call them val1 and val2, and we just want to make these both into strings. And we want to pass in the starting value of a string. So this is going to take our, num uh, our list, and it's going to start with a string, and then for each thing, it's going to concatenate those should be value two, those two values together. And that indeed gives us one, two, three, four as a string out. Okay, so we're gonna make a recursive version of this. Um, this is the trickiest thing we've done so far. Um, and we're just gonna take our time, work it through. And we're also gonna make a recursive version of the sibling of this, which is fold right. Um, and we'll come to that in a little bit. But between them, these two uh, functions should teach you an awful lot about recursion. And when we look at tail call recursion with Eric in a little bit, this is where we're going to start that discussion um, by looking at fold right and looking at um, the optimizations around this. And this will all become clear. So let's uh, start off. Let's um, just grab a bit of this placeholder text that we do, um, boilerplate rather. So we're going to start off with fold left. I'll just comment this out. Okay, um, and fold left takes a list, a start and a function as we've just seen. And if the list is empty, we return our start. So that's pretty straightforward. Now, the thing that makes this a bit trickier than the other examples is that when we've looked at previous versions of these, we've always mutated the uh, intermediate variable. So in the imperative thinking, we've mutated count by adding, we've pushed to a list, uh, and we've pushed to a list. And that's meant we can do very similar things here. We're adding two things, we are adding something here, etc. But for fold left, we are actually changing the intermediate value. We're not updating it. And so that changes fundamentally how we, um, how we can program this, how we can create this in a recursive manner. And what it means is rather than doing something with the head and then doing something with the tail and bringing them together, we actually have to bring both of those parts together into one expression. So I'm just going to show you what the code is for this. Um, so we're going to actually return fold left. We're going to return it on the tail. We're going to call the function with the start and the head and the function. So that's our, that's the conclusion. I'll, I'll talk us through it. Okay, so let's go run this. So we're running the summer function on one, two, three, four with our starting value of zero and we get 10. And we can also change this to be the concata function and we can run this and we get one, two, three, four out as a string. So let's think through what this is doing. Let's write some comments out. So the first um, version of this we're getting in, our tail is two, three, and four. And then we're calling func, and we're calling func with uh, the start, which is zero in our case, and the head, which is one, and then we're calling um, func. And because of the way computers work, we're always executing this first uh, function, inner function first. So this resolves to be, uh, which one should we do? Let's do the, um, let's do the, so yeah, we do the summer one. So we're summing these two numbers. So this resolves to be this, 
and then we call this. So we call fold left again. This time we're passing in one and two. So this is the second iteration. That's going to resolve some of these two numbers together to three. And then we are calling this, which expands out into which is six. And this expands out into the empty list of func six and four. Oops. Which translates into this. And we know that when we call fold left with an empty list, we return whatever the start is. In this case, it's 10. And so we return 10. And this is our final value. So hopefully you can see that working through. And the key thing that you're hopefully seeing here is that because this function, inner functions, get executed first, this is constantly just getting resolved to a sort of relatively simple number. And if we did the same with the concatting instead, just to show that, we would have this. And we'd end up with, hopefully that makes sense. We're going to look at fold right, and fold right is slightly more deep. So I'm going to look at a version of fold right. When you actually do fold right, um, you tend to flip some of the parameters around. But I'm not going to worry too much about that now, just for the sake of understanding. Um, but let's think about what we need to do with fold right. So fold left is taking the first element and applying something to it, and then taking the second element and applying those two things together, then taking the third element and applying the result in that element, then taking the fourth element and applying the result in that element. Fold right's doing the opposite. It's starting on the right-hand side, doing something to this, then applying that total and the next thing, and then all of this and the next thing, and back to the start. And so this sort of, I'll just put this back, approach we have here, where the function is in the middle, it's the first thing that's been executed, doesn't really work, because we have to reverse the logic. And so we can do that by moving the function to the outside. So the function is now going to be the last thing that executes, and we will do this um, calling on the start, um, and we will then, so we've got Fold left is now the inner thing, and the function is now the outer thing. So if we take this and compare these two, we previously had fold left as the outer and function as the inner. So the left, the head value is getting executed first. This is being resolved first. Now we're going the other way. So we're folding left, and we're going to keep going deeper and deeper and deeper until we get to the very last value, and then we're going to start expanding back out again. So you can think of this as a, a sort of very shallow function. It's just doing this straight away and then continuing. So doing the first element, then continuing doing the second element. Whereas this is a very deep function. It's going to keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper until it drills all the way down to that very last element, and then it's going to start breaking things back up again. So firstly, let's, um, this should be fold up, sorry. Firstly, let's um, check that this code actually works. So let's change this fold left to be a fold R. And if we change this to be a summer to start with, we should see no difference. It should still be 10, because it doesn't matter whether you add the numbers from one to four or four to one. But if we check this by um, concatenation, there you go, we're now going from the outside to the inside, so we've now got four, three, two, one. So let's draw out what's happening here. So the first version of this, we're calling with the function, 
and we're calling fold right with the tail, which in the first case is two, three, four. The starting value is, we'll do the concatting, is an empty string. We've got our func and we've got our head, which is one. Before we would resolve the function in the middle, if you look back up here, we could just resolve this to one. But we can't do that now because this is the bit we have to resolve, this inner bit. And so what happens is we now have to take all of this and move it into the middle here. And the second time we're getting, we're getting with uh, exactly the same. We've still got this empty string. We haven't done anything to this. We haven't resolved it. But we've now got function being called twice and this time folding in the middle with the new tail of three and four and the new head. And then we have to resolve this inner function again. And so we're gonna resolve this inner function. And this time tail is four and this is three. And now we have to resolve it again. So we take the whole of this, we move it into the middle here. I really struggle to get my brackets right at this point. I think that's right. And so now we've got this empty list and four. Does that look right? Brackets, brackets, brackets everywhere. I think that's right. Um, and so now at this stage, we can start resolving. So we can start by saying, okay, let's fold an empty list on a string. Well, we know that just resolves down to a string. And now we can say, oops, okay, well, we now want to, um, sorry, this. Okay, so we now want to resolve uh, empty string and a four, so that's a four. Now we want to resolve an empty string and a three. I think I've lost a uh, function somewhere. Sorry. This is, um, there we go, that's what we should have. It's complicated to draw out. Um, there we go. So now we resolve this. And now we resolve this. And this is our final, final value. So we've gone deeper and deeper and deeper until we've ended up here and then worked our way back. Whereas in this one, we stayed nice and shallow. And this is gonna be really important because immediately you can see that this, if it had thousands of elements, could get us into quite some trouble. Um, and we're gonna dig into this and ways to deal with this in tail call recursion, which is what we're going to come to in a little bit. Hopefully that gives you a bit of a mental model you can play with. Uh, if you haven't, I highly recommend going and implementing the other uh, uh, functions in this exercise before you watch the second half of the video. Because I think there's enough information here that you should be able to just follow this pattern and go and use uh, these recursive techniques on the other functions in the exercise. But then we're going to look at uh, two other topics. One is looking at a functional language, which I'm going to dig into uh, now by myself briefly. And then Eric's going to join us and we're going to look at some more interesting stuff around tail call recursion, some more advanced stuff with that. And I'm starting off here with uh, Elixir. Um, and to show you what this sort of recursion and things look like uh, in a language that's really designed for that. And then I'll also look at um, standard ML, which is an example Eric chose, uh, just to make sure you understand that syntax as well. So to look at Elixir first, I've copied in the JavaScript functions that we just built. Let's start with map. So one of the key things that uh, functional languages tend to have is pattern matching. And in pattern matching, you can define functions uh, where if they match a certain pattern, one version of the function is called, and if they match a different uh, pattern, a different version of the function is called. 
So we can, for example, create our count uh, function here. And we can say, in the example where, um, uh, sorry, not, yeah, uh, let's do map actually. Um, so if we do map, uh, and we're calling this um, like this. So we're saying we want a map function where there's an empty array. And if that's the case, we literally don't care what comes next. In that situation, we always want to return an array. And that's basically this line here that says, if the list length is zero, return the square brackets. So we're sort of pulling this out and moving it up. So we're creating a whole dedicated version of the function that's dedicated to this. And then we're saying uh, another version, which is map. And in this case, we're gonna have uh, a head and we're gonna have a tail. And there's very specific syntax you can see here. And we're also gonna have our function. Um, and then we are going to do exactly what we did before where we say, okay, we've got our function that we're gonna call with our head. I'm just gonna shorten these to be H and T just to give us a bit more room. Um, we're gonna call this with the head and then we're going to recurse and call this with the tail and the function. Let's take a look at that line of code. So we've got a version here that automatically knows about head and tail. It's got a, uh, a special um, piece of syntax for that takes the function exactly as we know, uh, and then does exactly what we're doing here. Function with head plus this. Now, there's actually better ways to do this in Elixir. Uh, Elixir enthusiasts will be shaking their head in despair at this code, but I just wanted to show a really nice sort of one-to-one -one mapping between these two versions. And just to show you a couple of others, if we did length, I think it's actually called count, um, which is why that was in my mind in Elixir's exercise, but if we do length uh, on an empty list, we return zero, which is just this line. And if we return length on a, uh, a list that, and we don't care what the actual item of the list is, of course, um, but we have uh, our tail like this again, then we can just do uh, one plus the length of the tail. And this is exactly the same code. So we're removing all of this boilerplate and breaking it down to a much neater thing. And again, licks of people pulling their hair out at this. Please don't, um, please don't slaughter me too much online. Uh, and then we'll just do reverse and hopefully you can see what's coming. So reverse on an empty list is, well, it's an empty list and reverse on a list that has a head and a tail is, uh, you can probably guess, uh, is the reverse of the tail, exactly like we have here, uh, plus the head, uh, like this. Um, so I just wanted to give you that as a little, uh, little snippet of what um, other languages that are designed for this look like and how nicely they can, they can boilerplate these things. Um, and we're now gonna jump in to um, a solution which Eric chose, and you'll see him talking a bit more about it in a minute, um, which is the solution to standard ML um, that you should see on screen here. Um, and this solution is very similar. So if we look down here at length, you can see we've got these two clauses the same. We've got length of an empty, uh, empty list is zero. And then we just have this bar, which is just like a second function length of something, and rather than using the, the phrase tail here, they say X's, XS, X's. It's just a different syntax. And rather than having the bar, you've got a double colon. This is just standard ML syntax. Um, exactly the same code. Uh, for map, it's the same thing. If you've got, uh, you don't care what the function is and you've got a list, it returns a list. Here you've got a function with the head, which they call X, and the tail, which they call XS, X's. You call the function and then nicely you just recombine it. So you're combining this as the, the head and this as the tail. So the two final um, functions I want to look at here um, for now, Eric's going to look at some more, uh, a fold left and fold right. And we spent some time earlier digging into those. You remember we drew those out and we discussed how fold left is quite shallow and fold right goes quite deep. Uh, so I just want to quickly go through what's going on here, just so you can make sure you, you can uh, you can read this. So we've got our first um, base case, 
uh, of an empty list. That just returns the start value. And then we've got a slightly more complicated looking um, normal case. And this is a bit more complicated just because we're not using very, in my opinion, descriptive names. So F is the function, Z is the starting value, X is the head, and XS is the tail, all of the other Xs. So function, starting value, head, tail. And we're then doing exactly what we did before, calling fold left with the function, um, with the function, the starting value, head and tail. And if you remember, we can resolve this straight away. So if we've got our list of one, two, three, four, um, and we're summing them, we would start off by summing zero as our starting value and one, and next time we could sum um, the one and two, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, fold R, on the other hand, um, is uh, this deeper version. So again, we have the exact same base case. We have the exact same um, syntax here. But you remember here that we call the function with uh, the head and then with the um, inner, uh, inner part being the recursive callout. And the, the arguments are in a slightly different order here to what you saw earlier. We're passing the function in first here. Um, that's, that doesn't really matter. Uh, but as we dig into that, I just want to make sure that you understand the syntax of those points. And this is the perfect time for us to um, bring Eric in. And Eric is going to talk to us about tail call recursion. Let's start with what is tail recursion? Well, um, I just mentioned that fold right call. So to, to, uh, to be able to call that function f with x and the result of fold right, you have to uh, first calculate fold right again. So the same function, but with different arguments. So um, that means you're creating something that's called a stack frame. It basically means you're doing a function call and something has to be put on the stack. And um, you can imagine if we have a list of a thousand elements, uh, before we can uh, calculate the, the, the return value of uh, the first uh, element, we have to calculate all those 999 other uh, values first. So that means the stack will grow by at least a thousand. Um, and that, that might not be an issue and probably a thousand is fine, but at some point, if the list becomes very, very big, um, you get the dreaded stack overflow, hence the name of the famous website. So um, a stack overflow means that you've, your recursion is gone on, has gone on too long. It hasn't stopped, uh, but there is a trick. But um, maybe uh, uh, one of the classic examples is actually in this implementation. It's the length function. So if we look at line 22, you can see that um, the implementation is one plus length of xs. So to calculate the return value, we have to calculate the length of xs. Uh, once we've calculated that, then we have to do something with that return value. So uh, we have to add one to it. And this is the key reason why this is not tail recursive. So uh, a tail recursive function means that um, the recursive call is the very last thing that needs to be executed. And that is not the case here. The last thing that needs to be executed is one plus the result of the recursive call. So um, if that's that's if you ever want to see if a function is still recursive, see if um, the it has to be just one function call at the end, and um, then it can be tail recursive. If it is a function call and something else is happening, then it's not tail recursive. So um, another example is the map. It's also a classic one on line 19. Um, you see here uh, the second argument after the colon colon is the recursive call, but there's also a thing before it. So to calculate the return value, you have to calculate both arguments. So you have to calculate the first element, you have to do the recursive call, and then you combine them, which means that, that the combining is actually the last thing that needs to happen. And that is not the recursive call. Now, the trick is if you have a recursive, till recursive version, is where you have uh, the function uh, is the, uh, the only thing that needs to happen at the end. And you basically, you don't have to put another stack frame on top of it, but you're sort of replacing the existing stack frame. So it's like doing an in-place uh, function call without having all those stack frames accumulate. 
So if you're writing a version of your function that is still recursive, that stack won't actually grow. The, the size will be constant because um, you can just replace all the existing values because, well, you don't need to keep anything in memory. So going back to that length function, we have to keep in mind that we have one plus length of XS. So we have two values that we need to keep track of. If somehow we could rewrite this to be just length XS, there is nothing that we need to um, uh, remember because all the information will be uh, available in the stack frame. So um, mm -hmm. there's a, but the this author actually has done a bit of work to make reverse until recursive. So let's see how that works. So um, in the reverse function, uh, let's first look at line uh, 12. It says loop uh, with the input list, that's the single argument, and then with the second value is an empty list. And this is a very, very important uh, part of writing till recursive functions is that in many of the cases, you will introduce a new argument and that's uh, the uh, sort of like the intermediate value. And um, like with our length function, we could pass in, we could create a function that would uh, have the current length. So the length of everything that we've seen up until this point, which means that um, we don't have to sort of remember that length because the length will be in the parameters and then it will be on the stack, it will be available. So um, that is the key trick that's being used here. Um, everything that we need to know to calculate the end result is already in the uh, in the parameters. So uh, what is that that loop function? So on line nine and ten, um, an inner function is declared. It's just available within this function reverse, and uh, well, it has two arguments. So um, there, the base case is of course reversing an empty list. And we, well, what do you do with reversing an empty list? You might think that hey, we're going to return an empty list, but in this case, we are not because the second parameter, that ACC or accumulator value, uh, is the uh, something that we've slowly built up. So that is basically the reverse list. So that is our trick. So we can just return that accumulator value. So as long as we ensure that the accumulator value is correct, um, this call is at least, of course, till, uh, till recursive, because, well, it isn't even recursive, it's just returning a value. Uh, but on the second line, so suppose we are still looping and the, the list that we are processing is not empty. Um, then we have x colon colon xs. So um, what we're doing now is in loop, we're saying, hey, we're going to do a recursive call of that inner function with the tail. But the key part is we are updating that accumulator value. And the way that we are doing it is that we are uh, prepending our, the current the first value, the head value to our accumulator. And the key part about this is of course that if you go through things from left to right and you keep on prepending, that is actually the same as reversing. So um, mm -hmm. let's, let's try our one, two, three list example again. So um, we're calling reverse with one, two, three. Uh, we end up at line 12. So we're gonna do loop list one, two, three with uh, the second argument being an empty list. This means that uh, line nine will not be true because our input list has items in it. So line 10 will be uh, will match. The hat will be one, the tail will be the list of two and three. Accumulator will initially be empty, but now comes the key part. We are recursively calling a loop with the tail, but the accumulator value is our hat, which is one, uh, prepended to our accumulator, which is still empty. So you can then read this as loop list of two and three and list with one. Next call, recursive call. The only thing that's being done is recursive. So you can see here that there's just a call to loop. There isn't any uh, prepending or whatever. It's just the function call. So it's still recursive. So second loop, the head will be two. Uh, accumulator will be the list of one. The tail is the list of three. So uh, we're calling loop with the first argument is just the list with three. And then we're saying two prepended to our accumulator, which was the list of one. So now the new list is two, one. You see, that's already being reversed. 
Now, next time we do the same thing. So uh, the tail in this case will be empty. So we're gonna say loop empty list and then with three prepended to our accumulator. So now we have three, two, and one. Um, well, and this time we hit line nine where the, the, the list is empty. We've, we've gone over everything. And accumulate already has the elements in the right order, in the reverse order. So we can just return that. And um, therefore, this is a till recursive implementation of reverse. Uh, and the key nice. part is line 10, where the recursive call uh, is the only thing, uh, is the last thing. It doesn't have to be the only thing, but it has to be the last thing that is um, being done in the function. And one thing I just want to uh, explain here as well is that you might be looking at this and saying, but I don't understand. Surely it's still adding these frames to the stack, even though it's the last thing, like it's still calling itself. But languages actually have tail call optimization, which means they can recognize this yeah. and they can uh, then understand that they don't need those previous frames. So like Eric said, they can just replace that frame. Yeah. So although at a glance, I don't think it would be obvious that this is some sort of magic, because of the way it's been written, your compiler or your interpreter uh, can do magic work to fix this for you. And not all languages have tail call optimization, uh, but functional languages are going to, and most other modern languages do have it as well. Um, so yeah, something to be aware of. And we're going to look at more uh, tail recursive solutions, I think, in the next um, the next one, Eric. Is there anything else you want to say about this one first? No, that's a that's a very good argument. It's not um, something that that is just magically uh, being done. Uh, you have to work for this. Um, your your language runtime, etc. They have to recognize that this is like a tail recursive thing. Uh, in some functional languages, you have to you can explicitly annotate saying that uh, I want this function to be tail recursive, and then if you make a mistake, uh, the compiler will actually complain. I think Scala 3, uh, 3 does this, and there will be more that, that have this. And um, yeah. so just look up your, uh, till, is my language still recursive? And you'll find out soon enough. Um, there are even weird cases where C Sharp isn't till recursive, but, but the runtime actually supports it. It's just that C Sharp doesn't. So it's somewhat weird. Right. But, um, uh, that is strange. Yeah. I think with, um, I think with Ruby, you have to, there's a flag I think you have to run Ruby with to enable it. I can't quite remember. Yeah. Um, they might have just done it by default now, but there was one point where you had to choose whether to enable it or not, because I imagine there is a performance cost for the interpreter trying to work it out as well. Um, yeah, if you have is, an interpreted yeah, language, it's probably, yeah. For compiled yeah. language, this is great, really, of course. Yeah. Cool, okay, okay. Yeah. let's move on now to an Elixir <coughs> version. Um, so this is, I guess, similar, Eric. Yeah. Um, but uh, but these are are these all tail? Yeah, these these all look good to me um, at a glance. So talk us through this one. Um, yeah. So the interesting part about it is if you think of how to be minimal. So um, we uh, we previously we had a lot of recursive. We had recursion for length, etc. Uh, in this case, it's called count because that's more idiomatic to uh, uh, to uh, Elixir, I guess. But um, you can actually write uh, count and reverse and, and a filter and map in terms of a fold left or a fold right. So um, it's sort of fold left and fold right are the core things that you need to implement. So you have to do the whole recursion uh, shenanigans bits there. But once you have those functions, you can actually define all the other functions in terms of fold left. So um, mm -hmm. we're, let's not bother with actually uh, looking into the fold left and fold right implementation because they're actually the same. Uh, they're just written in uh, in Elixir. But um, let's look mm -hmm. at count on line nine. So um, it's doing a fold left of the input list, which is L, with the initial value of zero, and that's not entirely coincidentally the thing that we had uh, used previously as an example. And then we are passing in, and this is the first time that, that we're actually seeing this, 
this is us creating uh, like a, a higher order function, an anonymous function, or sometimes called a lambda. Um, the terminology um, is different from language to language, but it's basically defining a function without a name. That's why it's called an anonymous function, uh, as opposed to count being uh, a named function. So we're saying, hey, uh, we're passing in a function, and uh, we again, we see the, the, the underscore, the wildcard thingy, that is the, the element in the list, which we don't care about, but we do care about the second uh, argument, which is our accumulator value. So that's the thing that keeps on changing from loop to loop. Um, so length is initially zero. Uh, we just return length plus one, and the full will do everything for us. It will keep on calling this anonymous function until we reach the end. And because we just increment our uh, initial value and then our current value, with one each time. In the end, what gets returned is the count of the list. So you can define uh, count or, or length uh, entirely in terms of a fold left. Really cool. That's really nice. Um, and then the others are doing that as well. So do you want to explain this ampersand syntax in reverse for us, Eric? So the ampersand syntax is uh, a very, very shorthand syntax for uh, um, for anonymous functions or lambdas, um, it is um, equivalent to doing a, a, an fn. So you can see ampersand one, ampersand two. That's basically the first argument, first parameter of the anonymous function and the second parameter. So um, uh, if you look up to the count, we had the underscore comma len. So we could rewrite that too with uh, replacing everything where len is with uh, ampersand two. And ampersand zero, we wouldn't even use. So um, it's a shorthand syntax for writing that uh, already quite short anonymous function. But um, the way that you should read this is like we're doing fold left with our list and the initial value is also the empty list. And then what we're doing is we're gonna say ampersand one, which is the item in the list. We're gonna prepend that to uh, ampersand two, which is our accumulator value. So the same thing that we just discussed on the, the previous solution where we had that uh, till recursive version where the element gets prepended to the list and, and so on. That's what's being done here. It's just being done in a uh, in an Elixir version. So that, that, that pipe sign, mm -hmm. so that vertical bar, that is equivalent to the colon colon of standard ML. Mm -hmm. And it's... It's maybe, I'm looking at map here as well. And so map is basically exactly the same with two differences. It's yeah. calling the function on the first element yeah. rather than just appending it. But also it's a fold R, not a fold L, um, which is slightly unintuitive. I would almost instinctively have thought reverse would fold from the right and map would fold to the left. But that's, uh, yeah, just the naivety of the terms by me, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. You have to you have to draw it out because if you if you prepend things, the last item mm -hmm. will actually be the first item in the end. So if you would do fold left with the map, you would you would get the right results, but in the wrong order. So, um, mm -hmm. but that's actually a, a standard trick in functional programming, mm -hmm. where you're doing a fold and then in the end you're uh, reversing the list. So and often mm -hmm. oftentimes uh, you would do this yourself. So. We could have written this as fold left and then in the end uh, piping this into reverse and then we, we would have the right results but uh, okay. yeah they, they they chose not to here so and this sort of segues us nicely really because yeah. if we take a look at the fold r here mm -hmm. we can see that that isn't tail recursive as you explained okay. to us. Yeah. you know the final thing there is not a recursive call it's a call of the function that takes in the the recursive call precisely yeah. um so everything else here is you know if fold right was tail recursive everything else here would then be tail recursive yeah. by the nature of the fact that we're reducing everything down um which i guess brings us on to your solution in f sharp eric um yeah. which is of course uh, from our functional maestro eric um is is going to be very optimized uh, but i guess here um fold right you have done some magic with so that the final thing here is um, is correct. Yeah. So uh, in general, fold left is 
till recursive, or at least it, it can easily be implemented as being till recursive. And of course, all your languages will do that. But fold write isn't till recursive because of the way how it's defined, where you you have that cascading, um, have to call the recursive and then calculate that first, that whole shenanigans. Mm -hmm. But um, what if you define fold write, uh, as I just said, as a fold left with the reverse? Well, you can do that. So uh, in this case, I have defined fold left first and um, the code is just, well, very similar to the uh, to the other code. You can see that it's still recursive here, but um, on line five, we just return a value. And on line six, where we have a recursive call, we're just gonna call the function. Um, one interesting note is that F sharp requires you to be explicit about a function being recursive. So you have let mm -hmm. rec, and rec of course, it stands for recursive. So uh, if you don't add rec, you will get a compiler error saying that you can't call yourself. So um, you have to be explicit about this. And some languages have this, F sharp at least has this. And other languages have this too, but not everyone. Um, then we define reverse in terms of uh, fold left, of course. So reverse is not also tail recursive. And then for fold right, um, we do list, reverse, and then we can't just pipe it into fold left for a very specific reason. And that's because that, uh, that higher order function. So you remember that we had the fold left, we had the element as the first argument and the accumulator as the second one. Um, that is the other way around for a fold right. So you start out with the accumulator and then you have the item. So that's the reason why I can't just pipe uh, list reverse and then fold left. I have to um, create my own uh, anonymous function, my own Lambda, and then do the reverse ordering. So you can see here on line 13, so fold left, we have as the first argument, fun uh, ACC item, so the accumulator value and the item. But uh, for uh, uh, the argument that gets passed into uh, fold right, it has them the other way around. And that argument here is called folder. Um, I'm not sure fold, fold R folder is great naming, so sorry about that. Uh, but we're calling <laughs> that function that gets passed into fold right. Um, it's sometimes called fold back, by the way. So maybe if your language has it like that, you could also look for it. Um, so we're just reversing the arguments. And, and some languages even have built-in functions to automatically flip the arg argument order. But here I'm just being explicit. I'm just uh, making it such that the folder that gets passed into fold R is the one that we can pass into uh, fold left. And nice. then we have a, a, a cool. two recursive uh, fold right. But there is of course a caveat that we have to reverse the list mm -hmm. too. So, um, it fully depends on whether or not uh, the, the size of your list and, and of course other things too. Um, and sometimes this can be a good idea and sometimes this can be a bad idea. It's not that in general, this is great. Um, not everything needs to be till recursive. That's also a thing. Uh, just try it out for yourselves. Uh, if you have small lists, it probably doesn't really matter that much. Um, uh, if, but if you have very, very big lists, it definitely will matter. And um, reverse mm -hmm. is often highly optimized in functional languages because it's such a core core thing because of what we've just all mentioned. But uh, yeah, so um, don't just um, make this your default implementation of fold right, but, but think about it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, those are the end of our solutions. Um, we did have some other bits and pieces as well, but we decided that this was probably enough uh, volume for one video without it getting unbelievably long. Um, I hope that was an interesting and useful little tour. Um, I definitely, if you haven't solved this exercise yet, recommend trying it. I definitely recommend trying it in both imperative and functional paradigms. Um, I think it's really interesting to uh, think about both and play about with both. Um, and you can also try and make it um, tail optimized as well. Uh, and there's lots of other really good exercises that lend themselves well to functional programming. We looked at protein translation last week. We're going to be looking at more in the coming weeks. So I do recommend just doing lots of these exercises until it starts to become natural, until recursion starts to feel comfortable. And for most people, if you're not yet feeling comfortable with it, there's just like a clicking point where at some point it just, our brains go, oh, okay, that makes sense. And from that moment on, it seems incredibly simple. And we wonder why we never got it in the first place. 
But when people are learning recursion, it is one of those things that people find difficult and challenging. I know people have been saying that on some of the videos when we've mentioned recursion. So yeah, don't beat yourself up about it. If, if you are finding it a bit challenging, it's, that's totally normal. But there will be a point, an uh, inflection point, where suddenly it all just it makes sense to you. And then along with higher order functions and pattern matching, the delights of functional programming will, uh, will emerge for you. Uh, thanks, Eric, um, for taking us on that little tour. Um, thank you, everyone, for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.